Good evening and welcome to the first of the summer session lecture series. Uh, my name is Charles Jeremy and I'm connected with the, the School of Continuing Education and Summer Sessions. And we're delighted to be in Bailey Hall and the hospitality we've received already is terrific. Uh, as I said to Bill backstage, we usually are running around trying to find someone to open the hall and we have four people here who are working with us. And if you also notice, about half of Cornell is torn up, which is also why we're in Bailey Hall, because Call Auditorium is being renovated and Alice Statler uh, is under construction around it and so we couldn't use it. In any case, we're delighted you've come. 42 years ago last week, tonight's speaker was sitting in Bailey Hall. A rising high school senior in Cornell's advanced placement program now called Cornell University Summer College, Dr. Sally Sattel enrolled at Cornell a year later and she graduated in 1977 with a BS degree in neurobiology and behavior. In 1980, she received an MS in biology from the University of Chicago and in 1984, an MD degree from Brown University. She did a residency in psychiatry at the Yale University School of Medicine. Sally is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, a staff psychiatrist at the Partners in Drug Use Rehabilitation and Counseling in Washington, D.C., and a lecturer at the Yale School of Medicine. She has testified before Congress on veterans' issues, mental health policy, drug courts, and health disparities. She has published articles in many professional journals including the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, the American Journal of Psychiatry, and the Journal of the American Medical Association. And she writes frequently for such popular publications as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, National Review, New Republic, and Slate. Sally's books include PCMD, How Political Correctness is Corrupting Medicine, One Nation Under Therapy, The Health Disparity Myth, and when altruism isn't enough, the case for compensating kidney donors. Her recent book, co-authored with Emory psychologist and also Cornell graduate, Scott Lillenfeld, brainwashed the seductive appeal of mindless neuroscience, was a finalist for the 2014 Los Angeles Times Book Prize in Science. Dr. Sally Sattel, Fifty Shades of Gray Matter, the seductive appeal of popular neuroscience, and the need for healthy skepticism. Well, thank you for that uh, lovely introduction and for mentioning it was 41 years ago. I'm particularly grateful for that. But I know I sat right there. I, I do have a vivid memory of it. In fact, they. they I forgot who was speaking, but he literally said, look to your right, look to your left, one of you will be gone in four years. I'll, I'll never forget. I guess they're kinder and gentler now, right? Okay. Um, good. Okay, I'll try, I'm going to try to leave uh, a lot of time for, for questions, but there's also quite a lot to cover here. Um, when I started writing uh, this book, Brainwashed, um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, slick stories were everywhere with headlines, this is your brain on love, on envy, on happiness, um, let's see, on God. Um, and it was a really, it was a big deal. In fact, in some ways it is a big deal, the way this, uh, the way neuroscience has become popularized. And those headlines, of course, were reliably accompanied by articles boasting that color-drenched pictures of brains, slides capturing the activity of, oh, that's a beautiful color-drenched slide, I have to admit, but uh, th those are fibers in the brain. Um, but, whoops, Buddhist monks, as they meditated, and then were, of course, after, this is an EEG, but and they've also done brain images of monks uh, meditating, in fact, this is one of them. Uh, addicts who are um, in brain scans, looking at whether or not they uh, uh, choose um, 
how they crave cocaine, college sophomores being asked to choose Coke versus Pepsi, practically any kind of, of ex experiment you can think of um, has been, in, in, in be human behavior, has also been done now with an imaging counterpart to it. And the brain, uh, the phrase brain scans show has become ubiquitous in news stories. Um, but, you know, what does it mean when the media tell us that, for example, brain scans show that vegetarians and ve vegans are more empathic than omnivores? That was a true headline because that was a true article which had a true press release, which the journalist probably read instead of the true article. But um, then another, uh, another headline was, uh, Rejection Really Hurts, Brain Scans Show. So what does this mean? Well, in some ways, less than we might think. Um, often not much more, depending on the question asked, often not much more than we already know from asking people about their inner experiences or from observing and testing their behavior. But, and I want to get this out right now, <laughs> this does not mean that fMRI's functional magnetic resonance imaging that's what fMRI stands for. Brain imaging in general, fMRI is a type of brain imaging. Uh, am I saying that they have no use? That is the last thing I'm saying. Remember, I'm, I'm addressing popular, pop neuroscience here. Real neuroscience done by real neuroscientists is a enormously important and fascinating enterprise. Um, the technology specifically of brain imaging, a functional MRI, is, is breathtakingly, it's breathtakingly complicated and it's breathtakingly remarkable and gives us, does give us important information about the brain that we usually, that neuroscientists, I'm not a neuroscientist, that neuroscientists typically use with other brain-derived information. So really rigorous studies with fMRI uh, usually also involve other technologies as well, such as EEG and, of course, uh, careful operationalized self-reports um, other, and other kinds of measures. Um, so, uh, but I'm talking today largely about over-interpretation by the media, mostly. I've, I've seen a handful of neuroscientists themselves get, believe their press releases, as they say, but uh, typically your average neuroscientist is is, uh, his heart stops when they see how some of their work appears in the, in the media so dumbed down uh, and uh, with so little caution that this is either hypothesis or this is just very preliminary kinds of data that then need to be followed up. Um, and not only uh, is the media, uh, does the media often have a field day with uh, neuroscience, Acknowledging that, yes, there are some excellent science writers, usually find them in Nature and um, uh, Science Magazine, and now online, Wired, and so and so. But the mainstream media uh, often pay, play fast and loose, and increasingly, we see images coming into the courtroom. And that's really where the rubber meets the road in terms of our potentially our everyday lives and other people's lives, where a nor there's a, a lot at stake in the, in the context of, of the law, clearly. Um, so brain uh, specialties, or you could say neurospecialties, I don't know, this is, these are small, but you get the idea, um, are just flourishing on campuses. Um, some of them are serious intellectual disciplines, uh, neural, something called neural law, for example, um, and that basically has to do with what we can infer about the state of mind of a criminal from looking at the brain. Um, something called neuroaesthetics, what's the neural basis for perceiving uh, beauty? Uh, neuroeconomics, what are the neural bases for financial decision making? I just highlighted the ones that are, um, that, that I believe have a deep literature. And some of them are, frankly, a little ridiculous. Um, Neurohistory, I, I looked that up because I, I, don't, I still can't tell what it is. Um, and I don't think that's to do with, you know, <laughs> Napoleon's adventures based on his dopamine levels, but you'd, you'd almost have to think that. Or silly, redundant, pr pretty, um, really, they're just out to make a buck, I'm sure, 
what we call neuroentrepreneurs who push things like neuromanagement. If you read a, a good neuromanagement book, what you find is a lot of good management uh, advice and a good management uh, science with superfluous mentions of uh, either neuroanatomy or neurotransmitters, and it really is there kind of to dress it up and make it sexy and seem much more authoritative. But the brain, of course, is nothing if not sexy, and, uh, and for darn good reason. It's the, uh, it's the brain. It's the most complicated structure in the known, biological structure in the known cosmos, probably structure period in the known cosmos. It, it's a masterwork of nature that's endowed with cognitive powers that outstrip the capacity of any computer that's built to, to emulate it. There are 80 billion, roughly 80 billion brain cells called neurons. Each of those communicate with thousands of other neurons for a, a total of neuronal connections that are actually more than the uh, stars in the Milky Way. It's, it's really a daunting, it's a daunting thing. Um, and how this enormous neural edifice gives rise to subjective feelings is one of the greatest mysteries of science and philosophy. You probably all remember the, you know, the hard problem of consciousness, that's it. Um, as one philosopher put it, how do you, how does the, how does the water of the brain become the wine of consciousness? I mean, that's, that's beautifully put. We don't know. And some people think that answer will never come, and, and some are, are um, less skeptical. But it's not around the corner. It's a hard problem, and it's called a hard problem because you can't even imagine what the answer is going to look like. So add to the fact that we're talking about this staggeringly amazing organ. Um, we're talking about pictures. FMRI uh, makes, and brain scans are pictures. Humans are visual creatures. That makes pictures very, very compelling. More so, I would argue, than when we talk about genes, which are also pretty compelling, but there's no great picture to go along with them. Um, also, along the way, maybe we'll uncover some secrets about human nature. Well, that's pretty darn compelling. So between all these possibilities and promises, it's one big, perfect storm of seduction. Um, so what can they generally tell us about subjective mental states, uh, beliefs, intentions, desires? Uh, they can give us some information, but as of yet, complicated thoughts, it's impossible for them to uh, capture complicated thoughts. Now, I, uh, I want to just stop right here and make sure that we're all on the same page as far as um, there being no room, in, room in, in this room, or in this lecture, I should say, for dualism. Um, the brain is uh, uh, the mechanism of, um, uh, well, the brain is in a way the mechanism of, of the mind. When we talk about the brain, we talk about neurons, circuits, neurotransmitters, the cerebral cortex, brain stems, um, dopamine, serotonin, I mean, you go on and on, but those are, that's the language of the brain. The language of the mind is the language of the person. In other words, remembering, perceiving, concentrating, loving, hating, planning. And all of those emotions and, and dispositions and intentions are, of course, made possible by the physical actions of the brain. There's no question about that. Uh, when the brain stops, the mind stops. Uh, if you want to talk about a soul, that's not for science. I'm, I'm not saying it, I, I don't know whether it exists or not, but it's not something science can answer. So that's not part of this conversation. Um, uh, the, what we think, what I think of as, as, as a soul I, uh, would be something that is um, not measurable by the quantitative means we have available to us on Earth at this time. So again, it's, it's to ask about a soul is not in and of itself a scientific question, but you can ask testable questions about consciousness and other things. Just, just wanted to set that out as a, as a baseline. Um, so again, back to what can the mind tell us about the brain? Uh, well, can it tell us, for example, like what we wanna buy? 
Um, this is neuromarketing. Can it entice people to purchase products? Well, this book isn't, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it, it's got the greatest title ever. Um, and the guy holding it is quite an entrepreneur. And um, basically, it cannot do those things. But it, one reason why neuromarketing is, is becoming, it, it's becoming somewhat popular on um, Madison Avenue, I guess, they still use that, if we still use that term, but among advertisers is because uh, what advertisers and marketers have traditionally used to assay what people want and what they like and why they like it is not particularly uh, good. Uh, focus groups, for example, uh, experts started to question their value in the 80s. I mean, they're good for, like, for example, someone, uh, there's a group of, um, of let's say mothers and and they wanted uh, the marketer wants to know how their how children eat their cereal well of course they can get information that way but the kind of information that has to do with a whether you would buy something is notice notably unreliable when people talk about their future behaviors and also why they like something people are people know what they like but they're notoriously bad at knowing why they like something so it's, uh, there are limits there. And it's true that people are actually not so good at introspecting. In the sense, they do it all the time, but they're not ex particularly good at um, intuiting their motives. So has anyone been in psychoanalysis? You would know. So, um, so the idea about neuromarketing is basically, well, let's cut out the middleman, meaning the person, and ask the brain directly, you know, what is, um, what appeals to it, so to speak. And, and this is related to uh, behavioral economics in the, to the extent that, if you recall what Daniel, how Daniel Kahneman talked about the two types of cognition, type one and type two, one is more intuitive, more instantaneous, the other is more deliberate and uh, more prone to being edited. So the idea is to catch the sort of the true, more, more authentic uh, emotion by going straight to the brain. Uh, thing is, though, that's extremely, extremely hard to do. So um, I will give them, I understand the, ra you know, I understand the, the desire for wanting to, to essentially address the brain directly and not ask the person because people are unreliable. But the brain, uh, in some ways, is, it, the brain is not going to, yet, I should always say yet, because we have so much more to go. It, to the extent that what we know is, is a mile long, I, I, some, t some people will say we haven't moved a foot. So, uh, but yet, we can't infer things from the brain about how people are gonna behave in the marketplace. Too many intervening variables, it's too hard. Can the brain detect lies? I'm gonna get back to that. Can the brain, oh, I, somehow I lost a slide here. Um, but you can see the neuromarketers are out in force. Um, can the brain detect lies? I don't know if you can see this, but this is another uh, example of neuro-entrepreneurship. And uh, it is actually a company. It's called No Lie MRI, which I just think is great. Um, and they, pr they advertise themselves as a, a lie detection agency. Uh, they don't use the traditional polygraph, but they image your brain. And um, we're, I'm going to get back to this. Uh, it hasn't been admissible in court yet, although there have been a few at attempts. And uh, the, I think among their most uh, avid um, users are cheating spouses. I mean, that's the kind of thing they're, they're really are. You, Honey, I didn't do it. Well, let's get some proof. And and some businesses may actually uh, use them. Although, as you m may or may not know, no business except the federal government can legally use a polygraph during, in employment. Um, very quickly, uh, what are brain scans themselves? Um, oh, okay, that was about having to do with the court. And we're gonna get, uh, I, I said, we're gonna get back to some actual cases. Um, Okay, in fact, 
when I mentioned that the uh, NOLI MRI was used in a few court cases, uh, one of them was a psychologist who was accused of Medicaid fraud. Um, another was a, um, a, a father who was accused of molesting his child, so he, and he sought this to exonerate him. Uh, again, neither were admitted in court, although there was a Daubert hearing, uh, a, a, a scientific admissibility hearing for, for one of them. Okay, so what are brain scans? This is, there are two, two basic kinds of brain scans, st structural and functional. This is structural, meaning it just shows you what's there. It's, it's, there's no physiology represented. It's just a static picture. It could, it could easily be your knee. Um, people get MRIs of their knee all the time, for example. It could easily be Homer Simpson's brain, I imagine. Um, functional imaging, functional, the word functional imaging, um, can identify, uh, looks for, if it's fMRI, it looks at blood flow. You may have heard of PET scanning, positron emission tomography, that looks at metabolic uh, activity. Uh, so uh, those scans are, at, those scans though, no matter what the mechanism of, of, uh, of detection and measurement. The idea is that they are measuring neuronal function in some way. And so this is actually, it's the same, you use the same uh, machine for both MRI and fMRI. They're just different elements uh, in the sense that the fMRI, again, the functional MRI, will show you um, hot spots of activity. Now, when you see these, I'm sure you've seen lots of these slides. When you see the activity, this doesn't mean the rest of the brain is, is black. I've seen some of these slides where you just have a picture of the brain at, with a few areas lit up, you hear lit up, and the rest is black. That's not what the brain looks like. The brain is always on. What uh, these technologies measure are increases in activity from a baseline. The only brain that's black is, uh, is a dead brain. So. Um, the machines look like this. I guess you've, some folks may have had, been in some of them. Um, they make an enormous racket. Uh, when you participate in an fMRI study, uh, it's usually 30 minutes to 60 minutes, which is really long. And uh, the, the very huge magnet in that circular part of it, uh, such that if you don't take off every ring and bit of metal you have, it could go flying. Uh, off you, or if it's an implant, through you. So, you, so some people could not even uh, get fMRIs because the magnetic field is so intense. Um, but uh, that's what it's done in. And uh, the Technicolor brain scans uh, that we see, you know, are not pictures in real time. It's not a photograph of your brain. It's so inviting to think of it that way. I mean, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive to see it in any other way, but really these are, um, what this is capturing, oh, what this is capturing actually is changes in blood flow and specifically the oxygen, greater oxygen levels that, uh, the more blood flows, the greater the oxygen concentration and oxygen causes hemoglobin to have a different magnetic property so he, oxygenated hemoglobin uh, will actually register uh, in the magnet through, a, and then there's a whole series, I feel like that New Yorker cartoon, remember it says, <laughs> have tons of equations and then and a miracle happens here, but, but that's what it's like with an fMRI. I can certainly provide folks with the, the background, um, but it, you can spend a whole course in it. It's enormously co computationally complicated, but basically that activity that is picked up in terms of changes in oxygen concentration in various parts of the brain are uh, translated basically into pictures like, like that. And what the subject does when he's in this thing, it, or she, is lay there, and uh, clearly it's a group that's already selected for not being claustrophobic, right? But, so it's hard to do anxiety studies sometimes. But um, 
Anyway, the person lays there trying, you know, cadaver still because you want to contain the motion artifacts as much as possible. And they either, an, an, an easy experiment would be to read, <clears throat> to read something. How do you read it? Well, usually there's a little screen, either there's screens in your goggles or they have a, a, a mirror that's angled so someone can hold some reading material but the person in, in there can read it. And then as they are performing these activities, either sensory, uh, percept perceptual activities, uh, that involve the visual cortex back there, sometimes tactile, um, experiments involving touch, uh, or experiments involving hearing, that would be, of course, reflected in your acoustic lobes, over, um, temporal lobes over there, auditory cortex, you know, then you'll see more activity there. And this pretty, it's rather straightforward when we're talking about sensory types of things, or motor, if I tell you to move your finger, you'll see a little motor strip, uh, a little uh, activity in what, the motor strip that's here, reflecting the fact that you're moving your finger and thinking about it. But, um, but when it comes to complicated emotions and thoughts, again, that is hard, hard, hard to do. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm just gonna skip along. Okay, now, um, this is a, this was an op-ed in the, in the newspaper a while ago. Um, in fact, it was by that biology guy. And uh, so it says you love your iPhone. Oh, I don't know if you can read it. I guess it's pretty small. You love your iPhone. And basically he goes on, why do you love your iPhone? This is neuroscience at its, at its worst. But this is what is popular. Uh, I, why do people love their iPhones? Because, he says, when he has people listen to their iPhone ring uh, while they're in that big machine, they see, he sees a flurry of activity in an area called the insula, which is a real, um, it's certainly it's a real structure in the brain. In fact, it's an enormously complex structure. And uh, he, he uh, inferred from the, that activity in that area meant affection. Well, this is very hard to do. First, this area called the, the insula, which is a subcortical area, has been um, associated with so many things. It's associated, frankly, with mediating the experience of disgust, but also with sudden insight or even uncertainty, uh, and especially awareness of bodily se sensations and integrating them, pain, hunger, and thirst, it has an, a broad physiological portfolio. So frankly, it's no surprise it's activated in a lot of fMRI studies, and in, and in fact it is. Um, but it, what, he, what um, uh, Lindstrom did there was commit the, the sin or the error of reverse inference. In other words, uh, assuming that because some part of the brain showed activity, that the person uh, whose brain it was was experiencing a certain kind of, of uh, uh, sensation or, or um, emotional feeling. That's a very tricky thing to do. This is especially clumsy, I, I grant you, so that's why I showed it. But uh, even in more refined studies, uh, the amygdala, you've heard of that. Well, here's another example. Uh, oops, I'll skip that. This was yet another. It's, uh, it's poor times. They've also had some very good articles in their science section, but this is not the science section. This is the op-ed page. Um, this is your brain on politics. Well, this is a while ago now. It's seven years ago. But these people have a uh, neuropolitics firm, uh, FKF Applied Science, where they, uh, I believe, are still doing similar kinds of studies to infer from uh, these uh, uh, neural profiles, what people are, uh, are um, how people see certain candidates. So, for example, in that op-ed, they described a small study they did. Remember, this is 2007 in preparation for the 2008 um, election when Ro and Romney was involved there as well. And they found, lo and behold, when they showed people pictures of Mitt Romney, that there was notable activation in 
Now that area, you, you, um, trust me, is the amygdala. That's a part of the limbic system, part of what we call the fear circuit. However, the amygdala can be activated and when people are having many other kinds of, situa of experiences, uh, when they um, encounter something novel or when it's something unexpected. So uh, you have to, oops. <clears throat> so you can't take these things at uh, face value when they see them in the media. They looked at other people too. They looked at Hillary Clinton and uh, a part of the brain of Swing. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you whose brains these were. I apologize. These were the brains of swing voters, people who hadn't decided who they were going to vote for. So when they showed the picture of Hillary to these folks, um, many of them showed activity in an area called the anterior, anterior cingulate cortex. And that area, it is true, is, is involved integrally in mediating conflict, um, any kinds of conflict, like uh, just, um, I don't mean uh, political conflict. I mean when there are two impulses that are conflicting or two uh, um, kinds of, um, or two ideas perhaps. Uh, th this is an area that, that's, that's known to play a resolving role in these conflicting uh, cognitions. Well, what does that mean in English? Ambivalence, right? So people were ambivalent about Hillary Clinton. I mean, again, that's not news. So uh, take it all again with a grain of salt. Okay, and this is why, this is a joke slide, but um, it's, it's, it's why uh, there, in the field, I don't know how many folks here are you know, are in this field, and if they are, they certainly know that, you know, now there's a bit of a, a debate over, is there a backlash against neuroscience because it's been so dumbed down in certain, um, in certain domains, uh, or, you know, it, it, it basically a sense of, we want to have some careful, you know, some responsible neural literacy here, and these kinds of, of uh, caricatures are, are really not helping. So, in fact, most studies now well, of, that use fMRI are, are much more, are, are far less devoted to these, what you'd call modular uh, kinds of approaches where you look at various regions that uh, light up, but are much more focused on the integration of these regions in, in the form of circuits. The brain is vastly interconnected, and that's really where the action is. That's how the brain works. Not pieces of it uh, lighting up. Uh, when we see these areas of activation, they're, they're real, uh, but they correlate with what a person is uh, uh, feeling. Uh, we don't see the whole brain. Some areas are, have, uh, have increased activation, but we don't see it all on a particular image. Um, and besides, we don't under know the ways in which all these regions are communicating with each other. Uh, because they're all involved in circuits. And, and when uh, basically the action follows just another path, you might get a different kind of in, internal experience. And that's, it's just so complicated, and we're just starting, starting to learn that. But it has been called neophrenology. I don't agree with that at all, but it, it, it has, but it's not. So what can we do with, uh, what can we do with fMRIs? Um, they were developed in about 1995. They've probably been developed for decades before, but um, it became available for use in 1995. So 20 years is a pretty short amount of time. Um, perfected all along, the magnets are getting stronger and stronger. The, the computational work behind constructing the scans is getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, well, let me just say a few things that we can do right now, uh, because so much of this work is experimental. But right now, for example, surgeons use, uh, use uh, fMRI in, um, when they are operating because of brain on the brain, because they want to, for example, certainly preserve the language center. So they can, that is an area that can be engaged in obvious ways by having someone read or speak and, uh, or understand other people, other people speaking. And uh, the surgeon can map out where that area, effectively, where the, where the margins are. So 
Uh, he will very much try to stay away from that if, if there's need for brain surgery for removal of a tumor, for example. Uh, it's a good way to uh, find an epilepsy uh, locus, can track recovery after a stroke. There is a um, uh, neurologist at Emory who is, uh, has done work on actually deep brain stimulation where there's, there's a, she actually stimulates a part of the brain in people who have profound severe depressions and she discovered which part of the brain to activate based on her work in fMRI. There's also some promising uh, work that while we really can't look at a brain, and I'm a psychiatrist, we don't use fMRIs to make any diagnosis at all. And if you've watched that PBS special with Dr. Daniel Ammon, don't believe it. You cannot diagnose by looking at the, you cannot diagnose schizophrenia from depression from whatever by looking at the brain. Yes, there are patterns, but they're not discrete enough for me to say there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between, between what you're experiencing and what we know to be a, a particular disorder. However, there is some uh, early work showing that uh, certain areas of the brain are more or less responsive to certain tasks has predictive, some predictive value in whether, let's say, uh, someone with anxiety or depression will be more um, whether their symptoms will be more responsive to cognitive behavioral therapy or medication. So, you know, prediction is a wonderful thing. You don't necessarily have to know how something works in order to get a good relationship between uh, signal and outcome. If it's there, it's there. You want to understand how it all works. But if you have some reliable predictor, that, that's a good thing to have. Okay. So a big theme of our book is not cocaine, um, is what we call, what, what Scott Lilienfeld and I call neurocentrism. Neurocentrism, meaning a bias towards seeing the brain as the most useful source of information about behavior. Um, now, we have to be very cautious about neurocentrism because sometimes it is the most important level at which to understand a kind of behavior. Um, if you have a Alzheimer's disease, for example, or, or Tourette's, that is the most important level to look at if we want to understand it and if we want to, to, to cure it. Um, but the problem with a reflexive neurocentric view is that it distracts us from other levels of analysis for understanding behavior. Uh, like the psychological and the social and the environmental. Uh, a highly neurocentric view uh, implies that biological interventions like medication or um, even, even surgery or stimulating a part of the brain directly, that they're invariably the most effective first-line treatments. That's, that's an implication. Um, and that's very, very problematic. And where I see that manifesting most um, powerfully is in the area that, I, that I'm, a, um, I'm an, an expert in, excuse me, clinically, which is addiction. Now, people see, well, you can see here, I, 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 that there is, I, I'm not going to explain the slide except to, to say um, this is actually a PET scan. And there are differences that uh, are, re reflect activity in the so-called reward pathways. And the reward pathways, as the name implies, are very much involved in drug taking, anything pleasurable, anything, especially things we anticipate and, and seek out. Um, and that's the difference between the brain that's on cocaine and the one that isn't. Even though you, it's hard to, to, to uh, tr trust me, that one has uh, more activity in the limbic region that I mentioned. Um, that's also called the emotional part of the brain. It also involves the hippocampus for memory, because you need memory. To have an emotion, you need memory. You have to remember what was frightening or enjoyable or sad. Um, well, what does this mean? The, the way that, that this kind of a figure is often used 
is to say this is why people who have drug problems can't control themselves. This is why drug addiction is a quote unquote brain disease. This is why addicts are using drugs in an involuntary manner. And you know, on the surface that has a sort of appeal to intuitive appeal to it. But let me tell you that no brain scan, and I, I'll have to say yet, can differentiate between an impulse that wasn't resisted and one that is irresistible. But worse than that about this, the brain disease, which I always thought to me is a classic example of neurocentrism. Addiction is one of the most com complicated human behaviors there is. And if you focus on the brain solely, of course the brain is involved in addiction, of course it is. Um, this shows the uh, enhanced dopamine activity in that reward pathway. Uh, it's enormously, it's, and dopamine is not the only neurotransmitter, though people talk about that a, a lot. Um, very, very complicated, no question about that. But if we stay at the level of the brain, you know, we forget the person. And people who use drugs and people who become addicted to drugs, there are reasons for that. People use for reasons. And, it, and I don't mean to imply for a minute that they're bad or this is a moral thing. It's often, especially when you talk to people in treatment, I'm not talking to, to about folks who just you know use recreationally, but um, it's an effort at self-medication typically. And, and there are reasons they do it and reasons they stop. They stop because, well, just think of the people I saw last week. Uh, they came into my clinic. And when I say stop, I mean they either stop. And most people stop on their own, which is something that is not known. But I can certainly provide you the epidemiologic data for that. Most people stop using on their own. I'm talking heroin and cocaine. The folks who are in treatment programs, the, the people who end up being studied more uh, are inpatients and people seeking help. And those folks are more often than not, not always, but more often than not, <clears throat> they have additional problems with anxiety or depression. But, um, but the people that I see in, in our methadone clinic, why did they come in, right? Either they stop on their own, I don't see them at all, right? Clinicians don't see these people. So we have a skewed vision of what the universe of addiction is like. We see the people who can't stop themselves, or I would say don't know how to stop themselves. Uh, they feel they can't. We tell them they don't know how to and try to sh and show them how to. Um, well, they stop because um, their young kid was sobbing because he believes his dad doesn't love him because his father never came to any of his ball games while his neighbors, the neighbor's kid was there all the time. Uh, this is one example, or um, a woman who said to me, you know, I've been using heroin by sniffing it, and then a friend came over and she took out a needle and she handed it to me and I thought, I'd never go to the needle. And that's when I knew, oh, this is out of, you know, I'm getting bad and I've got to get myself in for help, uh, or people who are about to lose their job. That's how most people come in. They're sort of, they're kind of pressured into it in that way. Or there is a great crisis of conscience. This is not who I am. I'm not the father who uh, uh, leaves the, my son on the, you know, in the game with no, no parent out there. Um, I'm not the person who steals from my grandmother's purse. That's not me. Uh, the point is, that doesn't quite mesh with the idea of a brain disease, which is all rendered in the language of neurons and, and circuitry and whatever. Of, of course the cognition, this is not who I am, is ultimately produced by brain cells, right? Because where else would it come from? But the level at which we interact with people as clinicians, we talk to them about what's important to them. They act on what's important to them. And that is all left out when you just focus on the, at the level of the brain. Now, why do people say it's a brain disease? Actually, I think it's a, it's a complicated political reason, and I wrote a whole chapter on that in the book. But, um, but, but what they say, and this is true, 
they say, well, drugs change the brain. They change aspects of the reward pathways. They change, uh, oh, they change parts of the hippocampus because, again, as I said, you have this memory, and some people have very intense craving that just comes out of the blue, and it's, it's really, really dislocating. And as hard as they might try to relapse when they get one of these episodes of craving, you know, they're, they're really at, at risk for starting again. Well, that is true. That is true. So drugs do change the brain that way. But what are the nature of those changes as far as behavior is concerned? In other words, the changes of the brain do not render the drug user impervious to uh, sanctions and rewards. And we see this in the uh, criminal justice system all the time. We see this in experiments all the time, which is to say when you offer people rewards for giving you clean urines, uh, they're much likely to stay cleaner. If you offer them, for example, a chance to get their charges dropped, which is what drug courts do, they uh, are more likely to give you clean uh, urine samples. When you, uh, when you uh, impose sanctions that are not severe, but they're swift and they're certain and they're transparent and they're fair among the entire group. For example, if you give me a dirty urine, you might have to spend one night in jail or you might have to um, do some other task that people would consider aversive. Uh, again, they get much cleaner urines. In experiments where folks are offered uh, little vouchers for movie tickets, these are folks in treatment programs, uh, if their urines are clean, you prefer to do positive reinforcement than the, than the sanctions, but you know, both are realistic depending on the circumstance. Again, much cleaner. Uh, doctors and the pilots are the best because when they are, if, if they've become impaired from drugs and they come before their boards, um, they are, uh, they respond at enormously high rates to the sanction of losing their uh, license and uh, the point is, this is a condition, even though there are brain changes, that, it, that is responsive to deterrence and to incentives. If I think of the brain changes of Alzheimer's disease, for example, it doesn't matter if I offer you a million dollars or threaten to, to shoot you if your memory worsens, it won't matter. Those kind of brain changes are are on an autonomous path, whereas the brain changes of, of someone who is a, a, an addict uh, can and do respond to these shifts in environment. Uh, oh, and I'll mention finally the story of the Vietnam veterans. I well, people know this, but it's such a classic story uh, and true <laughs> that uh, the use of addiction to, to opium and, and heroin in Southeast Asia during the end of the Viet, well, around 1970, 71, was, was pretty high, between 15 at, and 20 percent. That's addicted. About one in two folks, actually, guys, actually used. used. Uh, so that was, a, that was a high level. President Nixon was terrified all these folks would come back and, you know, ignite uh, heroin epidemics in the inner city. So he said, um, well, they inst he told the military to take care of this. And they instituted a project called Operation Golden Flow, which is priceless. And it was, you're not getting on that plane coming back unless you pee in a cup and it's negative. The vast majority of folks passed that test, you know, the next week or two weeks, whenever they had to. A few were held back to detox. They came back. Then Lee Robbins, uh, who was a um, sociologist at, the at Washington University, studied these folks, followed them for several years after. Just these folks who had the heroin problem in Vietnam, and uh, fewer than, uh, what was 12 percent of them had at any time in that three-year period you know, resumed heavy use. And that was, sh that was stunning at the time because, of course, the idea was once a heroin addict, always a heroin addict. They'll just, they, they're doing it here in Vietnam, they'll do it when they get back. 
but they didn't. And that shows you the power of, of environment. It shows you the power of reasons. Why do people use in, uh, in a war setting? Well, frankly, they're bored, and then they're terrified. Those are the two main reasons. Um, and then it's there, right? It's, it was plentiful, it was pure, and it was almost normalized. And these are all social kinds of um, dynamics that wouldn't affect you if you had Alzheimer's disease, or wouldn't, wouldn't if there are certain kinds of, wouldn't affect you if you have cancer. These are kinds of diseases that we, I call them diseases in the more traditional sense in that a person does not have voluntary control. So I spent a lot of time on this because um, it gets to one of the most important uh, uh, aspects of what uh, we are, uh, of the implications of, of getting better and better at offering uh, biological explanations for behavior. Uh, and what is to say, a, a kind of con confusion in, in uh, some cases about um, the nature of agency, uh, it, personal responsibility, um, civic, legal responsibility. If, if, if we can see it in the, in the brain, are we as responsible as you know, we thought we were, and, and my point is that, well, sometimes, sometimes the fact that uh, conditions originate in the brain, postpartum psychosis, for example, um, severe schizophrenia, I'm thinking of the psychoses, well, in those cases, um, no, the person really is not responsible because their rational capacities are so warped or their capacity for self-control is so destroyed if a person has a, um, a frontal uh, uh, um, injury to their frontal lobe, severe acute injury to their frontal lobe. No, sometimes that's exactly right. A biological explanation is an excusing factor, but, but other times it is not. It is just an extremely uh, seductive form of explanation. And there's, there have been a lot of um, interesting studies, you know, confirming that when a criminal's behavior is um, presented as, you know, Mr. Joe killed his wife because um, he had a genetic abnormality of X, Y, Z. Uh, he had a neurological defect. Uh, he versus, okay, so that's biological explanations, versus he had a bad childhood or he has a bad temper, people who hear the first two explanations uh, tend to think, well, he's not as responsible, and, and so we shouldn't punish him as much. And so that is a, um, that is a profound intuition that most people have. But the point is, everything's in the brain, right? I mean, everything's in the brain, because that's the source of all our, our feelings and thoughts and emotions. Everything's there. So we, everything is not excusable, of course. Um, we have to know what is and what isn't. What things in the brain are such that they affect uh, rational capacity to a great extent or self-control or the ability to be deterred, which are the, the general requirements that are considered for personal responsibility. And at this time, and I keep saying at this time because we'll get better at it, but at this time, looking into the brain is, is, not, uh, is not a place we can find answers right away. I'm going to talk for another few more minutes um, and skip some things. Oh, this was my hair. I hope you can see. Um, I uh, can't see very well, but that's a picture of a very distraught um, heroin addict. Um, and I'm going to, uh, we can return to talking about addiction later if you'd like. I wanted to get a little bit, that's neurocentrism. Okay. And these are the levels of analysis, all the levels of analysis that they are, there are. Um, and they all are parts of one another. That's called con constitutive reductionism, you know. The neurochemical level depends on the molecular genetic level and so on. But it's, I, I should, but between the brain level and the mental and psychological, as I said, we, we know the brain enables the mind. No brain, no mind. We don't know how, how exactly that, that happens. Um, but 
the point of the slide is just to show all these different levels at which you can talk about behavior. And when it comes to, I'll just get back to addiction by saying, when it comes to addiction, for example, the levels that, that are the most useful if you're a clinician are the psychological and the behavioral, because that's how we work with people best. Uh, we teach them how to av of either avoid those cues uh, uh, that cause craving, those classic people, places, and things that you, if you're an addict, you'll, you're told to stay away from your friends, stay away from the people you used to use with, I mean, stay away from the people you used to use with, um, stay away from places you use, stay away from, even try to change your um, inner state because some of the emotions you used to feel that would prompt you to use can actually incite craving. Um, that process happens in the brain, but the way people modulate their behavior, again, is through the psychological level. Um, the environmental level was actually, I guess, illustrated nicely with the Vietnam study. They were out of that environment. Um, they didn't feel the need to use as much, and also related to the, the, their psychological level because they had different reasons to, uh, uh, they didn't need it as much, for example, because, again, the boredom and the fear and wasn't as prominent. So, uh, this is lie detection. Uh, well, anything's better than that. The short answer about lie detection is that um, uh, in the lab, you actually can uh, dis differentiate neural signatures of people who are uh, giving, uh, t telling you a very specific kind of lie. Uh, the, and from people who are telling you the truth. And that lie is literally, did you take the watch or the ring? People are brought into a, an empty room, told to steal one item from a desk. It's either a watch or a ring, but someone's watching. So there's ground truth that's known. So it's known what they took. Then they're put in an fMRI machine and, and uh, asked questions about what they took. And they're told to uh, basically lie. And because they were observed, you know, there's an independent way to know whether they were telling the truth or not. And the folks who lied, if you took all their brains and, and uh, pooled them, you find a different set of, of neural signatures or neural activation versus the group that told the truth. However, there is a lot of overlap in the groups, but, the, but they are different. When they're pooled, they are statistically distinct. So that's interesting, and that's kind of a proof of concept. The idea being that um, it's more, it takes somehow more neural energy to, to, to lie because it's an act of suppressing a truthful response. Um, but this isn't workable in the real world because in the real world, uh, you're not told what to lie about. There are incredible stakes, things at stake. Um, there's nothing at stake when you lie in a, in a, to a professor. Um, and you can easily fool the machine by doing math in your head. So, uh, so that's, that may always be the Achilles heel, it's not clear, of brain-based lie detection, that, that, you can re that you can beat the machine that way. Uh, but, uh, but it is interesting that there are general patterns of deception and truth in that highly narrow sense, and maybe we'll get better at that, distinguishing that too. Um, neural law, as I said. Um, this is a brain of, a, of Herbert Weinstein, who was a 65-year-old account executive who uh, had a big fight with his wife and uh, then strangled her in the course of said argument and then tried to make it look like a suicide by pushing her out the window and, uh, of his Upper East Side apartment building. And he was apprehended as he tried to sneak out the back. So his lawyers thought, well, you know, I don't know how to get around this one. Um, and so they did, because he even admitted to pushing her out of the, out of the window. So they did a brain scan, and to their amazement, they actually found this. Basically, you can see uh, that he has, that, that, that um, clear area is actually a, a cyst, and it was a, flu a fluid-filled benign tumor 
that had scrunched over the part of the frontal lobe quite far, and it's hard to tell, but in the, the area, the rim of tissue surrounding that tumor was, is, is um, this is a PET scan too, is hypometabolic. And the implication of that could be that he couldn't control his temper because he was, um, you know, in a fit of rage. Now that, it makes a good narrative. But there are limits to this as well because, you, be, believe it or not, there are actually lots of incidental findings um, in uh, uh, people's brains and they don't always correlate with, with behavior. And in this particular case, this gentleman probably had this a long time because uh, if you have an injury, that, if you have a phenomenon that big, if it's sudden, then you would be highly symptomatic. He had no headache, he had no motor problems, nothing like that. And, um, and uh, it, it turned out actually, well, the case never, they, they actually pled down and he did get a, a much lighter sentence. But none of the neurologists who examined him uh, thought there was a correlation between what looks, really is impressive, it's true, um, also, there was no change in his behavior, no other change in anyone's be in his behavior. It's just rare to, it, 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 it was, with a de defect that looks that big, if it really did affect his impulsivity, you would see that in other, you know, arenas of his life as well. Um, and finally, when they asked him, well, would you like to have it removed? He said, no. Um, so I, you know, you think if you were walking around with a time bomb in your head, you'd want someone, to, you'd want something that you'd want it to be removed. But he'd been living with it for so long asymptomatically that he, that he didn't. Um, now I'm going to, uh, uh, I think I'm going to close up here simply because um, I've said a lot, and I guess I've spoken for an hour, and I, I'm sure you have questions. I'm sure there are areas here that, uh, um, you know, need to be elaborated on. And, and that's what I am uh, going to uh, do at this, at this time. Uh, I will just, again, close by saying that, uh, you know, beware of the dazzling um, pictures, uh, the visual power of this, what is stunning biological portraiture, and also a tidy of a tidy brain to behavior narrative, which is to say, if we see this, then we can, you know, then we, if we see this in the brain, then either the person has this thought, will enact this behavior, uh, or has this feeling. It's just not that simple. Um, neural literacy here becomes incredibly important. Uh, neuroscience is one of the most important intellectual achievements of the past half century, and it's young and getting its bearings, but to demand the wrong things, to over-promise on what it can deliver, and to apply the technology prematurely uh, tarnishes its credibility and risks diverting, um, you know, resources from the really, from questions that are better, 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 better defined. Um, as I said, I think one of the most challenging cultural, proje cultural projects in the years ahead or how to reconcile these advances in brain science with notions of personal, legal, and, and civic freedom. Uh, just try to keep, in, the best way to anchor yourself is to think of you know, brains uh, at, in the neurobiological domain of physical causes and the psychological, which is the domain of the mind, of people in their, and their motives and their wants and desires. Uh, wants and desires and, and frankly fill in the blank, every kind of human, uh, kind of human phenomenon that way, mental phenomenon. Um, both the mind and the brain are, are essential to understanding human behavior. Um, and there are different frameworks for explaining experience. But the distinction is not um, academic. It, I think, really has very important implications for how we think about human nature and responsibility. Thank you very much. I guess I could start with you. Hello. 
Uh, you presented with reasons of skeptic, skepticism for the um, uh, re reliability of the uh, imaging techniques. Can you tell us of any positive uh, results and, uh, from those imaging techniques that are reliable enough that can be taken as a reliable science? And a second quick question, if you can comment anything on the field of connectomics and the, um, uh, its reliability for the future of neuroscience. You know, I couldn't hear you very well. Um, that, that's very, it's kind of fuzzy. Um, I, I can, can you just ask questions. one of those questions again, slowly? So first, um, okay. any um, positive results yep. for the imaging techniques? You presented with well, reasons I, of skepticism. And, yep. and second, about the connectomics, if you can comment anything. No, I, okay, I thought I went out of my way to make sure I, w I was talking about some of the positive things. Uh, well, first off, these are, it's, it's in the research domain largely at this time, not in the clinical. Uh, it doesn't help us in the clinical world and doesn't help us yet in these other public domains, such as the courtroom or marketing efforts or lie detection. That was my main point. Uh, I mean, I run through my list again, but I mentioned uh, it's used in surgical planning, so, so surgeons know where to uh, uh, cut so they can avoid certain sensitive uh, areas like language, um, uh, pre can predict responses to certain kinds of psychotherapies. Um, why don't I go over those with you later if you'd like, because I just don't want to use up too much time repeating myself. But I still didn't hear the second thing, comment on what field. I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologize. Connectomics. Connect oh, you mean like the connectome? Connectome, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, that is a huge project uh, underway. All I can just say is what it is. I don't, I don't follow it except to know. Connect the connectome is uh, an, a, a, an effort, um, I think, pioneered by Sebastian Young at MIT, and he wrote a book by that name. Of, um, of basically mapping out all the connections or major connections in the brain. It sounds like, to, it sounds like an absolutely daunting task given, given, how, given how there are so many, I mean millions and billions, frankly. But, uh, uh, but that's what he's, uh, I'm sure there are subsets within those billions, so it's probably, <laughs> A lot of classes of connections are probably similar, but it's just a massive undertaking that uh, I think it's. I think it may be part of the Obama Brain Initiative. I'm not. A, I'm not precisely sure on that, but um, uh, just that it's. It's a lot of neuroscientists have uh, significant hope that that will reveal quite a bit, and I certainly defer to their expertise on that. I'm asking this for my wife. Are there any current neuroimaging techniques which are predictive of Alzheimer's disease? There, again, uh, there are studies in this area. I don't believe that any, there's any re known, you know, reliable test that doctors are using at, at this time. But that is, I think they can follow it. That's one thing that I know that uh, that is done following the plaques and pro progress of plaques and tangles, but I don't know if any predictive kinds of, uh, of tests are, have become, you know, established in everyday practice. I, I tend to think, think not. Uh, just from the Alzheimer's book. Oh yeah, if you, and if you, if anyone here is an expert in something, please uh, add. I, I was using it. I mean, one answer could be details of the uh, neuropathology. 
I, I, not, I, that would just take too long to go into, and I don't feel like I'm enough of an expert in, in Alzheimer's for sure. But the point is that we see that reflected in, in the behavior. And that was really, that was really my point, and why it's, why it's uh, misleading, again, to focus on uh, the brain when you're talking about addiction, be because we think of, when we, when we think of something in the brain, uh, and maybe we'll, this, this intuition will fade over time as people become more familiar with, what we, with neuro, uh, neuroscience, but there, we uh, think of, uh, a, we think of a behavior that supposedly flows from a, from, a, from a neurological defect of some sort as being a behavior that is inevitable, that's, that is, is immutable and inevitable. Sometimes that is true in the case of Alzheimer's. Many times it is not. And addiction is, a, again, a perfect example of that. But this, this sort of reflex to think, oh, in the brain, not under control, you can see why defense attorneys love this kind of thing, you know? Um, now, sometime, in the future, maybe, maybe they'll be able to use it to some effect, but at this point, it it's, cannot answer questions about the kinds of capacities that the law cares about, which is whether a person can reason or control their behavior. That's mainly what we care about. Um, and that's what the law decides whether or not the basis on which excu to excuse behavior, you know, to basically excul exculpate someone. Now, it always can, can come into a, um, a mitigation phase, for sure. But right now, when these brain images are used in um, uh, courtrooms, it's, it's always in capital cases because the alternative, you know, in other words, it's, gee, Your Honor, yes, my... My um, client did this, but see this thing in his brain, he wasn't fully responsible, so, so don't kill him. You know, let's have him spend the rest of his life in, in, you know, in jail or prison. That's, that's the way they're used now because the threshold, the threshold for scientific soundness of evidence is very, very low in death penalty cases. So that's how they can get them in. Hi. Hi. Um, earlier you comment or, or agreed that once a person become uh, or goes through a period of heavy consumption and then uh, stops through seeking for help, mm -hmm. they become ad addicted uh, for the rest of their life. Is this also true for people who decide to stop on their own and are able to stop it and never go back. Hmm. I said I said something about being addicted for the rest of their life. I'm uh, not you, sure what. You, I don't recall. You made a that. comment yeah. about. I, I remember you saying that, and this is actually something they use uh, in group therapies. They, you know, they use the one, you know, one day at a time kind of thing because they do mm -hmm. feel that once they are oh, addicted. Oh, they just feel you always have the vulnerability. That's what that means. Mm -hmm. Once an addict, if you mean that you're always... Yes. Yeah, well, look, anytime you engage in a behavior, um, you are going to be more vulnerable than someone who didn't to engaging in that behavior in the future because you have the experience of it. And presumably, you know, when people use drugs, they, these drugs do something for people in the short term. In the long term, a lot of life, there's a lot of destruction. But in the short term, there's a lot of quelling of anxiety, uh, just a, a lot of um, f feeling that is, is it's just something that is a state that addicts desire. Um, so they always have that memory. And so even if they're clean for many years, you know, if there comes a time when they get a divorce or there's a death or some in, intense stress, they are going to be more vulnerable than someone who never had that experience with drugs. I mean, more vulnerable to return to it. Doesn't mean they will, and it doesn't mean they have to. But statistically speaking, they're going to be more vulnerable. Uh, that's that's what I meant. Um, but by no means is it a is it a, a 
100% prognosis, but by no means at all. Um, I hope that was clear, and I hope I understood your question. I'm not sure, but you can come up and ask me after. Hi. Hi. It seemed as if you were implying that there are certain, certain categories of uh, neurobiological pathologies in the presence of which it's acceptable or sensible to kind of exculpate someone ethically from an action, and that there are other categories of those pathologies which don't permit that withholding of ethical judgment or condemnation. I'm just curious if you have in mind a framework to make a distinction between those two categories of pathologies, especially when it comes to something in kind of a, a gray area like uh, you know, childhood lead exposure, for example, where there are areas, you know, there are ways you can think about of making you know, psychosocial interventions, but also pharmacological ones, and also maybe the possibility of kind of throwing up your hands and saying, well, this is um, intractable. So I'm curious if you've you thought about how to make that distinction. Well, the distinction that um, <clears throat> the distinction that holds is sort of the one. If you're talking about in the in the in the legal domain, again, it it is it is basically comes down to whether the person intended, you know, the guilty mind, mens rea, whether there was intention to do harm, whether the person is is reasonable. I, I mean, it, it is rational. In other words, can think clearly about their situation. And uh, uh, the third is whether they can uh, control themselves. Now, I'm going to give you one example of someone who strikes me as a classic case of, uh, in fact, ex who's, uh, who's exculpated and is a classic example of someone who, who should have been, which is um, Andrea Yates, who is the... Um, She's a woman who in 2001 drowned her five children in Texas. And okay, she was delusional. She thought she was, this was a postpartum psychosis. She thought she was upset, uh, possessed by the devil and her children were going to, to suffer for it. She really did know what she was doing was, was wrong um, in the most narrow sense of the word. It, wrong meaning she would be probably arrested for it. But she proceeded because she felt she was saving them. So she would fail the test. She certainly had the, she certainly had the intent. So there's no question there. She intended to do what she did, unlike a demented person who, you know, might flail and hit someone and do great damage. Uh, but so she knew what she was doing. But her actions flowed so uh, directly from her delusions, from her warped capacity to, to reason, that she was ultimately um, exonerated. Uh, now, we all, you're talking, now you were talking also about, when you mentioned children, it's interesting you mentioned that, because um, there's a lot of effort now uh, in juvenile justice to be looking at the, um, to think about the juvenile brain. And not in terms of even a, a juvenile brain that might have been uh, affected by lead poisoning. If you want to get to lead poisoning, the question again would be, because the courts, this is the question, it's always, did, did this, the cause doesn't matter. In other words, if it's lead poisoning, if it's bad upbringing, if it's uh, um, a low IQ, the cause, to the, to the court, as far as exculpation, saying the person is not responsible, is, is, a, is um, irrelevant to, again, the question of could they, could, whatever this cause is, did it affect the person's, again, rational capacity, intention, and ability to control themselves? Uh, and if the answer is, um, if the behavioral measures, again, of intent and, and uh, reason and control are there or are not there, either one. It doesn't matter what caused it to the court. Um, but these kinds of conditions do figure in, in mitigation. That's sentencing, and, and they do play a role. Now, the interesting thing is the double, uh, kind of the two-edged sword of this, 
because let's say uh, a child was exposed to, to lead and uh, became very, very, let's say, stipulate, we could draw a direct line between heavy lead exposure and child abuse and uh, fetal alcohol syndrome and everything. And, um, and this child probably, let, let's say there was such a compounding of, of these factors that he largely failed that test. Um, it's applied a little differently in juveniles, I'm, sh I'm sure, but you know, that he basically uh, you know, could not reason as we would expect a child of that age to, to do and, and, and control himself in those ways. Well, we still have to do something. Um, and so you know, we may be talking about civil commitment or, or whatever, but uh, when it comes to cases like this that are sort of less uh, out of the juvenile uh, range, um, some legal scholars have wondered, you know, people are more likely to, um, uh, some people are more likely to, to, to see a, a brain scan like that and think, oh my gosh, this person is a criminal for the rest of the, his life. His brain is damaged. This is an irreversible situation. We should punish him even more, or at least contain him even more. And others, I look at it and think, well, he didn't have as much responsibility, so we should even be um, more lenient. And the, I, I guess the one, if you'd call it a solution, and no one's, I don't think many people are too happy with it, has come up in the world of, believe it or not, that we deal with pedophiles, which is that after some folks serve their, their sentence, if they feel, if the, sometimes the person himself will say, I am not ready to leave, I am not safe, I still have these impulses. Um, or if the, the, the uh, uh, wardens and those people feel that the person is not ready to leave because he's been aggressive towards others, then they can uh, try to get him switched into the civil, um, basically the, the civil system. So he's no longer criminally detained, but then he becomes civilly detained because the rest of us still have to be you know, protected. So um, th that also transcends, you, you could argue, the sort of the, the cause of someone's behavioral dysregulation if they are so dangerous that they really can't be out among us. Okay, yeah, I think, oh, I think, oh, one more? Okay, this is, this is, oh, now two people have come. Sir? Is it just yeah. me? It's you. Okay, thanks. Um, from my, my limited understanding, uh, the two fields that have traditionally um, used the term mind as, a, as an area of interest in, and exploration are philosophy and psychology. Um, what is your, how do you view the difference between these two fields as they approach, use, a, uh, come up with definitions of mind. And do you think that there's hope that perhaps the two fields can come together in such a way to redefine mind uh, such that the, the, the gulf between mind and, and brain uh, may be more bridgeable? Well, there is an area called neurophilosophy <clears throat> <clears throat> which is, I suppose, trying to do that. But I, I would imagine that <clears throat> the, um, the work that would be most, most targeted would be people who study consciousness. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, 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 are, what you, are what you're getting, is what you're getting at the translation between activity in the brain? <clears throat> I mean, how, how it literally, how, how brain activity becomes subjective activity? Is that, is that, what you're, well you win the 60, I mean that is the question of the universe. Yes, right, uh, but, and that's, that's certainly right there in terms of what I'm thinking about. Yes. Right, well that's where I, 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 I think that it's folks who study consciousness who might come the closest to having ideas about how that would be solved. I mean, one way of putting it, I thought, Somebody said it nicely. It's like, could we ever get to the point where we'll be able to look in the, into the brain of a comedian and laugh? You know, um, we'll be, be able to look at 
will there ever be some sort of way that we can translate the representation of activity in neural circuits and, 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 and various transmitters and all the activity that goes on to there, to there into you know, an understanding of, 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 uh, of, um, of meaning? I mean, really, one is about meaning and one is about mechanism. Mm -hmm. I would say. I mean, I've always said that. The brain is more about mechanism and the mind is a, more about meaning. Um, and we don't know how that happens. And as I said, some people think it'll never be solved. I, that seems like a pretty, that seems like a pretty, you know, extreme verdict. But, uh, but no one can, I don't think anyone can figure out what the answer looks like, what that Rosetta Stone even looks like. Um, uh, let me give you, I just, I guess I'll go on. Uh, just one more. There's an article that you might like reading. It was in the New Yorker, I don't know, 2007 or so, but it's easy to find. I think it's called Two Heads. Two Heads Are Better Than One. I think that's what it was called. It was definitely by Larissa McFarquhar, and it was about a neurophilosopher named um, Patricia Churchland, who is um, someone who believes in what's called eliminative reductionism, which means which means one day we'll get to uh, the point where uh, we can talk about everything in terms of, of, we can use a completely neural language and we'll be able, let's say, to communicate that way. So you don't have to tell me you want something. All you have to do is tell me uh, or, or somehow show me what's going on in your brain and I will somehow intuit this because I will, under, I will know how those um, signals translate. So when she gets home from work, this was a, um, a vignette that was enjoyable and, and it was straight faced. It was, she comes home and she says to her husband, my cortisol is, uh, is through the roof. I've just been in traffic and I'm very, well, I've just been in traffic. My cortisol is, is, is very high. My serotonin levels are very low. Um, she mentions a few other things, which almost sounds like a sort of a parody, but that only works because they already have a, a language for that. In other words, we know stress and cortisol um, are related. We know that serotonin and mood are related. We know these kinds of things, um, but a whole language that's peppered with, and, and my glucose is this, and, and my uh, amygdala is firing at this rate. What, what are you to do with that in terms of, in the, except in the most generic way, maybe, well, if someone's amygdala is really activated, well, wait a minute, maybe we're back to the reverse inference I talked about. Maybe it means they're surprised, maybe it means they're terrified, maybe it means they're seeing something novel, who knows? But point is, that kind of translation, that, that solving of what I said before was the, the hard problem, the mind-body problem, is, is just not around the corner at any time. When I figure it out, I'll collect my, I'll meet you in Stockholm and, <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, thank you all very much for staying so late. <laughs> <laughs>